we'll go ahead and uh, continue. So I'll just uh, spend a few minutes just talking about some real world, uh, uh, well, I should say third party performance test results. Uh, we announced these yesterday. Um, it's part of a, a broad SSD testing that was taken up by the folks at DeMartech. And uh, this basically showed how they uh, tested the Nimbus S-Class product. Uh, they had one server connected over 56 gig in Finiban. Uh, they had some other servers connected over 10 gig, uh, iSCSI and SIFS, and uh, also over Fiber Channel. So they actually have one Nimbus S-Class. It's got Infiniband, Fiber Channel, and 10 gig all in a single box. And they tested all of the multi-protocol capabilities of the device. So it's a pretty, pretty cool testing strategy. They got the best performance as you would expect over Infiniband. So uh, what this here shows was an IO zone benchmark from a, uh, a Westmere based server, which is, which is PCIe Gen 2, mind you. So we were not able to really drive the full uh, FDR data rate, which is 56 gigs. However, uh, even with that, they were able to get line rate over QDR, two QDR ports uh, in parallel to the Nimbus. So that's what you can see here. Basically at uh, 64K block size, on a two gig file transfer, they were getting just shy of 8,000 megabytes per second. Uh, so uh, this, I think, that at 8,000 8, megabytes per second, that's basically two InfiniBand ports running at line rate. So our box was definitely able to deliver some pretty high performance numbers. And again, this is all uncached. When they did a caching test using a tool called TIO Bench, uh, they actually got bursts up to uh, 20,000 uh, megabytes per second, so 20 gigabytes per second bursting up. Um, but I'm not going to share that. I, I want to show you what the uncached true system numbers really are. And then on writes, uh, this is, by the way, after RAID 5, after sparings, after all the associated overhead, uh, they were getting uh, what the, let's see, at the one meg block size, looks like we're topping at around 20, 2200, 2300 or so megabytes per second on streaming rights. So, so I, don't, I don't think white on no, it's white. works is the best. I, I, uh, I apologize <laughs> for that. Uh, well, ignore the white one. The blue one's just as good, basically. So just look at the blue one. Yeah, these were cut and paste, and uh, yeah, I apologize for that. Is that. That doesn't help. <laughs> so in short, very, very good performance. Uh, they also validated our uh, uh, VMware storage API support. So. I know, Stephen, this is uh, near and dear to your heart. Oh, yeah. Uh, so we they validated that we have full ATS support, uh, uh, full hardware accelerated cloning, also uh, the block zeroing uh, capability. Is that a typo? That block. is a typo, block zeroing, correct. That should be block zeroing. Uh, <laughs> give someone a, someone's in trouble. Probably me. I think I did this slide. Uh, we also have this uh, SSD enablement, which is, which is pretty neat. It's a new feature in VMware 5 where um, done properly, you can present an, an SSD data store and VMware will discover it as an SSD data store. It enables VMware to uh, utilize our data stores actually as a form of virtual memory. So when you do provision in VMware now uh, data stores from the Nimbus, they will show up as SSD. Um, and, and this, I'm, I apologize, but there's no way to show it. That, that there shows that we have this automatic SSD enablement and this here where it says hardware acceleration supported is indicating that we uh, have got the, the uh, full hardware support. Uh, and then finally, as I mentioned, uh, about a week and a half ago, we announced that we are also fully Citrix ready. So we've got the same uh, certifications on uh, Zen server and Zen desktop. Uh, what about the HCL for all this? So we are on uh, Citrix HCL, uh, VMware HCL, not officially yet, but, but will be this summer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it even takes big three-letter companies a while to get on it. So. Yeah, that's why we're happy at least to release that a lab has validated it while yeah. we work on getting through the, the red tape in the meantime. Exactly. So um, that's Nimbus. Uh, maybe I'll take a quick break, uh, see if there are any other final questions I can address. Yes? Just the pieces of paper that are going around, is there any reason why some companies were put on there versus others? Or? Uh, those were the ones that we sort of have see as having the most profile in the market um, or are the closest to shipping. Actually, some of them are still not officially shipping a GA product, but they've at least published data sheets and we're asked about them most frequently. Do you view Wimtel as a competitor? You know, they, they have some pieces, but can candidly in the long run, no. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm not sure I want to 
go after them too hard except to say that you know, they, they lack HA in a single system. Uh, they don't scale. And a lot of their IP isn't their IP. And uh, I think that's going to be a challenge for any company going forward. If you're going to do flash management, replication, deduplication, it really helps if you're actually the creator of that technology as opposed to just licensing someone else's IP and integrating it into a, into a box. Uh, we don't really see them terribly often. You know, the one that definitely is in the market very vocally um, is certainly violin memory. Um, but to be candid, 90% of the time we're competing against the incumbent NetApp or the incumbent 3PAR or the incumbent EMC box that's up for a retirement and needs to be replaced. You wouldn't see the violin memory there their SLC as a competitor, like that's a total different volume, or do you think you compete with their SLC line? I think we compete with, with all of it. You know, there's, they're out pitching this all flash solution that they're really focused on performance. And I don't believe you have to sacrifice performance uh, to get the full compute and software capabilities of our product. And that's one of the reasons why we publish these benchmarks, because even on their SLC single box solution, we're outrunning it on throughput by you know, a good amount. And on the IOPS numbers of 800,000 IOPS, we're outrunning their MLC product, which I think is at 500,000 IOPS, we're almost double that. Uh, and we're continuing to improve our performance. So the way I see it is that our functionality is a superset of what they do. So they need to be, for them to be viable, I think in the long run, they have to be a lot faster than someone like us because we've got more functionality at a lower price point and they're not a lot faster. In fact, their latest product that they just announced a few months ago, I, uh, I think they've got to make it faster if they really want to carve out that market. But that, that brings me to one of kind of these... Tom, we got distracted from <coughs> Who was that you were just talking about? Uh, Violet. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, yeah and that, that kind of brings to one of these discussion points. I know we're, we've got five minutes left, but we can jump through these. You know, what is the real market size of the so-called tier zero that, that they're playing into the sort of dragster storage uh, kind of market at the very, very high end? My, my personal view is that it, it will be swallowed by tier one. Um, that the large part of the market will see the performance of our product, the software functionality of our product, and say, you know what, maybe one is you know, 10 or 20 microseconds better than another, but if the Nimbus solution has all the software and is half the price, you know, why am I going into this tier zero solution? So I think this tier zero, which is already an a niche, really just kind of keeps shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and is ultimately absorbed by tier one. The scalability and the price and the software advantages of tier one will just, I think, run, run tier zero out. I also think unified storage is key. I, I think this is a market that has significant legs. If you just look at the industry, iSCSI, NFS, Fiber Channel, FCOE, FCOTR, SMB, SMB3, SMB Direct. I mean, there's just no relenting. There is no convergence. So having a multi-protocol solution, I, I believe, is, is fundamental. And when I look at companies, you know, like some of these other flash companies out there, they're, they're single protocol oriented, which means their focus on the market is going to have to be significantly narrower than where Nimbus can play. Yeah? If you deploy one of your systems as multi-protocol, do, um, do you have to isolate certain disks for this protocol and certain disks for, oh wow, so it's even more, huh, yeah. else does that. Yeah. Well, because the block ones are files in the file system, yeah. as opposed to a Solera, where the block ones come from the back end Absolutely. and the file ones come from the front end. Yeah. Yes, Robin. Yeah, hey, I have to apologize for my previous comment, where he pointed out to me that uh, I misread my own spreadsheet uh, and I was looking at <laughs> transaction times, and that you can't really get IO, you know, individual I/O times out of TPCC benchmark data. So uh, I take it all back. Or, anyway, <laughs> I, I would love to see it. I'd love to see uh, Ours. Nimbus yeah. do a TPCC benchmark. Coming this summer. Uh, okay, yeah, great. Absolutely. No, we'll be know. there. Let I will. What you come up with. I cer we certainly will. Okay. Uh, uh, then, you know, I also talked a little bit about the off-the-shelf, you know, SSD boxes. And, you know, and, and to me, there's a, there's a couple challenges with this. I talked about our parallel processing architecture and how in a conventional server, you have all these bottlenecks that come from a limited number of SAS lanes or a limited amount of internal bandwidth. You can't really get the full performance of Flash. So I think they're in a, in a tough predicament because they're not going to be that high performance. Furthermore, 
they're not really differentiated. If it were that simple, you know, then someone like a NetApp or an EMC or any of the incumbent vendors can just yank out the hard drives in their enclosures, pop in SSDs, and be right there. So I think part of the whole thrust of this is that Flash is a new architecture. It doesn't just require new software. I really do believe it requires new hardware too. And that's why I'm a very, very strongly in the belief that you know, unique form factors, proprietary hardware are where this market goes in the long run as opposed to just assuming off the shelf always wins. Uh, you know, some other thoughts, you know, PCIe Flash, what I want to just clarify here, I think its most profitable days are behind it. I don't believe that this market is shrinking, actually the, the exact opposite. I think this market is growing. But it's but becoming a lot more competitive. It's becoming extremely competitive and I think the margin and the profitability in this market has already been sort of squeezed out of it. And the reason I believe this is because there are many factors at play. For one, DRAM is uh, coming down in price. I know, you know, right now DRAM is around 12 bucks a gig. Yeah, but uh, in the VMware market, the, the cost of the VMware license to support the RAM is what we'll eat. <laughs> well, that's a good point. I, I hadn't really considered that. But w what I had looked at was that you don't have to worry about these acceleration filter drivers that don't work with VMware, for example, like on the EMC Lightning, can't handle vMotion, yeah. tend to be proprietary. you got to do all this code loads. You know, and with the latest Romley servers, whereas in the past it was really tough to put you know, even 512 gigs of RAM in a server with Romley, you can go to a terabyte even beyond without having to get into esoteric designs. So I, I think DRAM is one competitor. Commoditization from many players entering the market. You saw Intel enter the market with a $5 per gig PCIe card. It's a quarter of the price. The performance isn't quite the same, but I think it's getting commoditized. Then you know, the fact that I, I also believe that if caching is the real deal, uh, there's just no way that that's going to be an independent piece of code in the market in the long run. That's going to be part of the hypervisor or part of the OS. And if that happens, the differentiation around caching goes away. That will also take pricing down. Yeah, and I, given what Microsoft did with ReadyBoost, for yeah. them to tweak that code and put it into Windows Server 2012 R2 is not going to be a big deal. Yeah, and I think we saw the same with like MPIO. I mean, that, that, yeah. you know, now that's all just part of the OS. The other thing, though, I think is sort of the silent troublemaker in the long run, and I, I hate to say this because the PCIe folks hate it, I think, when I say this, but it just seems inevitable to, me, inevitable to me that a server vendor, if it is thinking at all, will put a flash chip on the motherboard with a little slot and, and say, hey, uh, Foxconn, uh, for five points of margin, put a little chunk of NAND on this card and you can just drop it in. And, you know, guys like LSI can do that today, Not maybe not the best technology with Sandforth, but for it's a, it's a $20 chip that can go right on the motherboard. And it's kind of like what happened with hardware RAID controllers. You know, it used to be that you had to put the three-wear card or the Adaptech card in all your servers, and now, you know, it's a $60 mega RAID chip on every single server. There's no hard, there's a very minimal PCE hardware RAID market anymore. Very tough. So I think that will also play a role here. Uh, as far as deduplication, I, I, I believe this is an expected feature. It's no longer a differentiating feature. And I also believe customers are smart. Uh, the customers we've spoken to are seeing right through this advertising cost per gig with the asterisk saying there's some dedupe rate assumed in it. Customers are going to start asking for, what's my raw cost per gig? What's the usable cost per gig after RAID and file system and everything else? And what's going to be the potential cost per gig with DDoop? And I think we also already talked about the hybrid model. I think in time that becomes a, a tough sell because flash pricing continues to come down. And with deduplication, reducing the data content, that also will reduce the capacity needed and I think eventually squeeze flash or these hybrid systems into a, a, a considerably narrower market. Uh, just some final two points. All flash, scale up or scale out, I think both architectures play. Uh, Nimbus believes in a, in a dual strategy here. Today with the E-Class we have a scale up architecture which is great for classic enterprise. With the S-Class we have a scale out architecture that's great for these web uh, infrastructure guys. Well, the only thing that we would be lacking if you're, is really a file system. Uh, you can put InfiniBand on the back of our box and build a grid around S-Class. The only piece that's really missing is the scale-out file system. Now, we can get into the scale-out file system business, or you can overlay GPFS, Gluster, Luster, PVFS, lots of different but, but options. But saying that I can make it scale-out makes it scale-out is a stretch. How so? I'm 
this is an independent device. Right. If I have 10 of them and I put GPFS on it, yeah. you didn't make scale out, I made scale out. Well, the G you're just talking about the integration of GPFS and, and our hardware. But you still need in the hardware, you know, the, you'll see what some stuff we have coming. I'll leave it at that. But I just want to say strategically, I believe in both avenues. And you'll, you'll see us have firm products in both areas. And then finally, this comment on memory area networks. The basic concept here is instead of PCIe in every single server, InfiniBand in all your servers and simply create a low latency grid network on IB between a shared flash memory device. And in that flash memory device, it could just be a bunch of PCIe cards. That's apparently what Thunder is going to be. And there'll be this memory area network. I think that also helps put pressure on, on PCIe. You'll definitely see Nimbus uh, participating in this market. Actually, we're already in this market today with the native IB connectivity on our device. Are you seeing customers and also are you expecting that InfiniBand is going to take a big pickup? Yes. We are working with customers today that have massive InfiniBand deployments. You saw, if you saw Mellanox's earnings, the last call they had, the stock went up 45% in one day because they blew out their number by like six, like ridiculously. So uh, InfiniBand is going to have a pretty good run here. Um, I, I feel pretty good about that. So anyway. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> Very much appreciate you giving thank us you the time. opportunity to yes. do this. It was a lot of fun. So, thank you.